My name is Jill Phillips and I'm the creator of Who's Shoes, a popular approach to co-production. I was named as an HSJ100 wildcard and want to help give a voice to others talking about their ideas and experiences. I'll be chatting with people from all sorts of different perspectives, walking in their shoes. If you are interested in the future of healthcare and like to hear what other people think, or perhaps even contribute at some point, Who's Shoes Wildcard is for you. So who is today's podcast guest? We've been talking about doing a podcast together for ages, but then typically the plan came together very spontaneously at the last minute, and it is very JFDI. For the last half hour, Christina Sorrell has been sending me links and zesty bits and lots of lemony ideas. It feels like peeling an onion. There are simply so many layers. Anyway, get ready for an energy-packed, inspirational podcast guest. Christina is in the Sure Trust Power 100 and a fantastic role model, raising the profile of disabled people. Christina might choose to share one or two of her own challenges and the special people who have helped her along the way. She works as a lived experience ambassador, and when I say works, I really mean lives and breathes. Everything I see and hear about Christina is about her bringing people with lived experience together in order to amplify the voices of others, especially those who might not otherwise have a voice, and also to help them have fun and a better quality of life. Christina has a very, how shall I say, colourful past, and she always adds colour wherever she goes. I've been on quite a few collaborative online sessions with her recently, and you never know what to expect. She has appeared in enormous sunglasses, and last week showed us all a big basket of lemons that her mum packed in her suitcase in Madeira. With Christina, there is never a dull moment. I found a comment that I wrote myself when nominating Christina for a Hilarious Patient Leader Award. So this is my quote. Christina is a real mover and shaker. She is really passionate about co-production and takes everyone with her. She is inclusive and human and makes me laugh, always pushing the boundaries and working towards positive change. And today we have something super duper zesty. I believe it's the launch of Lemonade Radio. So we definitely need to hear more about that. So welcome, Christina. Where should we start? I'm not even sure, really, because actually uh, you've said where we're going to end up, but where we should we start? I'm not sure. <laughs> How did I get here in the first place? Yeah, where are we now? So I suppose right now is, you know, you did mention what my current role is. Um, and I can mention it is NHS England and Improvement. So, you know, I'm the lived experience ambassador in the National Experience of Care team. But I'm also Christina, and I think that's the most important thing that I always try and bring to everything I speak about is I'm somebody with physical mental health conditions, with social care needs. And actually, you know, I'm not just a tick box. And, you know, I want people to recognise that, you know, our voices need to be amplified. And I think it's really tough to kind of like know where to start, really. But if I go right back <laughs> to uh, 2012... I used to work for local authority and austerity. Unfortunately, I was made redundant and so was my wife. And we were both managers in the local authority play services. And I think from then on, it was to get my health a bit more sorted and I had four operations. So I think my journey has been mm, a bit of a roller coaster, really. And it all started from falling off that wall back in 2003. Not a very high wall. I'm only five foot two. And I have to say, the wall was only four foot. We went and measured it. But, you know, <laughs> landed badly. But maybe I landed on my feet. I'm not really sure. But without a doubt, it changed me. It changed my life. And I was definitely burning a candle at both ends and in the middle. So for me, something had to make me stop and kind of think, actually, what are you doing with your life? I was an IT consultant back then in 2003. Working in the city, I was like basically partying all the time and just that one accident and breaking my talus and lots of people don't realise where the talus is, but it's the right in the core of your ankle. But I didn't just break it, decided to break it in half, dislocate and smash the other quarter that rotated into pieces. So even my ankle has been a bit of a story and three operations later, but it stopped me and it made me recognise did I want to work on multi-million pound projects or did I actually want to make a difference? And so that's what happened. I went back and gave back. I used to be a youth worker and then I went back and started becoming an outreach worker. 
So my community work lasted probably from what started as applying because I wanted to get into university, really. From what happened then to actually going back into a, an area that was at one point statistically was one of the most deprived areas of Western Europe to actually working for NHS England. It's been quite a journey, I must say. That's amazing. I love it when I talk to people because you only know so much about them and already I'm finding out things, you know, bits that I've heard or variations of. But I didn't know about that big career and the <laughs> big money. I guess inevitably I'm looking for finding that resonance with myself. So it was my own cancer experience that probably just changed everything. It just makes you stop and think what's important to you and is this really what I want to be doing? What matters to you, exactly. Yeah, what matters to you. It's powerful. Really powerful. And I think at the time I was an IT consultant. I had private health care and I was taken into a local hospital and asked, did I want to go on the private ward? And I said, would it make a difference? And they told me it was the same surgeon. Only one surgeon was willing to touch me to operate. And actually what was strange was only last year I was on a team's call. And there she was, my surgeon, after 17 years. And I hadn't seen her after she put me back together. So it was quite amazing. So my life, I do believe it's you, you meet people for a reason and you learn all the time. And so for me, having that moment where I was actually, I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. I'm going to go back. And I needed something that's flexible. And I didn't realise at the time that I'd end up with disabilities. And I was somebody who, as a youth worker, had set up the first Camden Disability Youth Forum when I was quite young, so I'll tell you a funny story. I took a group of disabled children across. We were meant to try and get to Guernsey. We never made it, and I've never been so sick in my life. Oh, I was so ill. Yeah, I definitely love a boat, but only if I'm you know, sunbathing. Oh, yeah, it was bad. But in Pool Harbour at seven in the morning, I'm screaming because they've tied me off. They thought it was really funny. I was quite a bit fitter back then before I fell off that wall. I climbed up, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll get it all sorted, you know. And yeah, the kids thought it was funny to encourage the staff to tie me off and they tie me off in the middle of Pool Harbour screaming to get me down. I'm really scared of heights. So I think I always find myself in challenging situations and I have to make myself laugh because otherwise I'll cry. <laughs> so I've worked with so many young people, people that were like between 13 and 19, 20, up to 25 actually, who had really struggled all their lives with their disability. So for me to then find myself falling off that wall and being that person that then was in that situation of needing help and not being able to walk for six months, I was just like shocked. I will never lie about being sick ever again at work because I'd been off sick and I was like, I'm never doing that again because you never know what's going to happen around the corner. So for me, it's that you really don't know where your story's going until something changes. And I think for me, I will always stop. I love chatting, but the thing is, I really love listening to people's stories and I love hearing people's journeys and how they got there. And we'll talk about it in a little while, but why Lemonade Radio came about and why it's coming about and being launched on the 6th is because actually we need to reconnect with people. Mm. And I think some of the work I've done during COVID has been amazing, but it's only been able to happen because we've been able to connect in a very different way, which made it accessible. I'm somebody who wasn't able to work full time for eight years. I mean, I went full time during lockdown one at the same time that my PTSD was triggered. And Without the support and working in an environment and with people like yourselves who just accept me for being a bit different and a bit of a joker in what was, you know, has been a really difficult two years, hasn't it, really? And I think coming to some of your sessions, absolutely, absolutely set up. If you see that photo anywhere, guys, for sure, those big glasses, they're not something I'd walk down the street in, but they were definitely influenced by going to your sessions. Without that, you have to expect the unexpected. And I think... It's just breaking down those barriers where people have forgotten to have fun, forgotten how to not take themselves so seriously, I think. Yeah, that's a heck of a lesson in life, isn't it? Just don't take yourself so seriously. Lighten up, <laughs> be a bit more, I don't know, just more more relaxed. And I mean, I've found that with the workshops I run, that as I get more relaxed and a bit more confident, then you can see other people get more relaxed and the sessions get more real absolutely yeah it's just human beings coming together isn't it so I won't tell you because this is about you not me I won't tell you about how I worked at Calais Hoverport 
and dealt with parties like you crossing the channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you wouldn't have got me on the hoverport, that's for sure, because I would have been like feeling sick. Now, we were on the lovely yacht. I'm sure it was an amazing yacht, but I was absolutely <laughs> petrified of being on... Yeah, it was a 70-foot yacht. Like, amazing. I absolutely love being near the sea. And, you know, you mentioned... Madeira and that's where my family are from and so for me I think a lot of my work and is remembering you know my mum's journey at at the end of the day my entry into this world wasn't that easy anyway my mum had a really rare type of cancer lyomysarcoma which basically layman's terms is a, a fibroid that went cancerous which is very very rare so rare that I actually met the professor that was her doctor for 20 years and he still called her the miracle lady so she was probably at the time been in England about five years didn't speak English much and if it wasn't for one nurse one nurse that took time my mum always don't know her name no idea probably you know not here anymore but one nurse who took her time to just in my mum's broken English work out what my mum wanted to do and it was in days of people not being told they had cancer so my dad had obviously been told she had six to twelve weeks to live and so he was not a man of many words as it is, was very upset. My mum said he bought her a bit of jewellery and she thought, oh, something's up. And so, yeah, so basically that nurse, my mum pretty much said to her, you know, is there anything they can do? And she said, there's an operation, but you'll probably die. My mum just turned around and said, I'm dying anyway. So I think that kind of strength from my mum. And if I think back now, I was a young carer. I had no idea. It was just how life was. I translated. I didn't bunk off school, never needed to. It's that thing of, actually, I've got that awareness and people hear me speak and I was born in London, I've got a real London accent. And unless you get to know me, you don't really understand what my background is and having been somebody who's been in that situation and not even realising, you don't realise how much it impacts a whole family when there's a diagnosis like that. I'm quite fortunate she did have cancer again. After 30 years, they were convinced it was going to be within 20 years so they kept her on the books for 20 years but she had breast cancer but you know she's still here at 79 you know it's amazing fantastic and actually it's one of the reasons I am launching a radio on her birthday oh happy birthday so that will be today by the time we put this out so happy birthday to Christina's mum so yes for me it's really important it's a year since I last played and going back to why I play on the radio is just, it helped my PTSD. I have PTSD from an awful situation 20 years ago that was triggered in lockdown one. And at the end of the day, that vulnerability and finding out I was in the shielded group was so hard. Without a doubt, it was so hard. I had no awareness it was going to impact me like that. And I just threw myself into work. I threw myself into work as much as I could and connecting with people. And that's what's been amazing is the connections that have been made, those network of networks. So we've got we've got network of networks, we've got Lemonade Radio, we've got Young Carers, there's all sorts of topics here. Now I could go off with any of those <laughs> because one of my favourite bits of Who She's work, I haven't done a lot, but I've done some and incredibly powerful. And what you said there about young carers and the young people, children at school, whatever, not seeing themselves not knowing that they're a young carer and for me with teachers in my family how many of those teachers know that they've got young carers in their classes and perhaps when they haven't done their homework on time or whatever it might be so I've got some powerful poems sometimes it'll be another discussion young carers and then connections you and I Christina could do connections I think our networks are such a big part of our lives, aren't they? And Yeah, absolutely. Trying to connect other people. And it's definitely part of my recovery. My anxiety and depression for when I was like 16, 17, probably stemmed from the situation at home. A lot of people think, oh, was it because of your sexuality? I'm like, no, not at all. I had boyfriends. So for me, it was, I've always believed in you fall in love with whoever you fall in love with. And so for me... When my parents found out I was dating a girl and threw me out, it was really difficult. So not only did they throw me out, they denied they threw me out to this day. In fact, there was quite a heated debate about only a matter of weeks ago. So people kind of block out some of the things they do in life. And you have to think, how do you move forward? And for me, it's not that I can forget because I won't forget. I'm a bit like a, an elephant like that. But I just kind of put my energy where there is good energy and and move on because actually you can spend so much time kind of wrapped up in that and of course it still gets you on a bad day but for me it's what good can I do and if I can help other people who have been in similar situations I always will so I ended up leaving home 
and what a lot of people don't know about, I sometimes might mention on Twitter is actually, I end up in a really bad domestic violence situation. So I'm in social housing now. I've got no shame to admit that I'm in social housing because I was given social housing because actually somebody tried to kill me. And so that was somebody else in a relationship. So for me, it's, you don't have no idea what somebody has in their past, what lived experience is, and actually what it takes to talk about that lived experience. So I did say to you that maybe I'll touch on some subjects and sometimes I won't, but you know, it's about relevance. And I think that's what comes out in my work, that relevance, you know, not going to throw it all out in one go because it doesn't help anybody, including whoever's listening to you. But what's really important is the relevance and how you can draw on your own lived experience in a safe way. And yeah. I would like to talk about how I kind of learned to do that, really. And I, I've got to really thank a few people who saw something in me. I started call cool over at the peer coaching service at Camden at Islington. He took me on as a peer coach. I hadn't worked for five and a half years. And we had clients. They were called clients. They're not service users. They all had a physical, uh, mental health and uh, social care needs. And I thought, okay, I can do this. I can do this. You know, I've been a youth worker, community worker. And I was like, why am I being matched with some of these people? And I just realized it's that connections. And we did a lot of motivational interviewing. And it was those connections that I made with people. And sometimes, you know, I had one lady and um, hopefully she'll end up hearing this. And is a fan of the radio too. But he was so much older than me, who had breast cancer, who had chronic pain and lots of things was going on for her but somehow we connected and the best time ever was going to community bingo (laughs) at a community lunch because I was just like I love eating and uh, community bingo and it was just those connections just being able to chat and it turns out she loved to talk nearly as much as me so uh, it's great (laughs) sessions but it's just giving somebody a little bit of light, a little bit of relief from what their day-to-day is and if I'd had me come in to my home as a peer coach five and a half years before maybe I'd gone back to work sooner yeah you know I think it's the power of peer work but people need to be supported and I think that's what's sometimes missing in some services is people don't recognize how much we give of ourselves each and every day you don't hide it away it's there people know that you're in those kind of roles but what's amazing is how much support, how much respect, how much love I felt and the people I've been working with over the last two years. I think I've had people, clinicians, managers come up to me and, you know, on virtually, obviously, but say to me about their own lived experience, but they're not in a situation where they can talk about it. And I yeah. feel like one day we'll get to that point where nobody hides away from with stigma, not just in mental health, sometimes you know, very personal health conditions too, that people just don't want to feel like they're different, don't feel like they're showing their weaknesses. It's not a weakness at all. Showing your vulnerability is not a weakness, without a doubt, but it's not easy. It's not, and I'm hoping, obviously, that the podcast series will help with that. The kind of people that I'm talking to, basically what they've got in common passionate people, interesting people, people who are making a difference. But everybody's got huge stories, really. And Absolutely. Definitely Yvonne Newbold comes to mind and Rachel Dewey comes to mind as two of the previous podcasts, people who are literally taking something that is a taboo subject, in Yvonne's case, violent and challenging behaviour in children, and then obviously Rachel rocking two stomas, and boy, is she doing that. So I feel incredibly privileged to be able to do that and it's funny as you're talking I and mean, obviously people are coming to mind in my life so you're talking about things come up and they're relevant and I would really like to give a shout out to Marcia I'll just call her Marcia she was my line manager when I had cancer and really I was off work for 16 months and I'd lost confidence big time and inevitably stuff yeah. happening at work and she just took exactly the right line in terms of helping me get back to speed and very quickly got back to speed but that was just how it worked out you know that day one back at work and having someone who believes in you a Jamaican friend of mine I'm still in touch with her and she's extraordinary but if Marcia hadn't been there who knows what would have happened to me well my my one's even more peculiar because my two people who spotted me really was my basically my therapist for my PTSD and uh, my surgeon. So I've got a sacral nerve modulator. So it's uh, like a bladder pacemaker because of my Ellis-Danlos syndrome. And, you know, I have 
bladder and bowel conditions and so basically my surgeon and it was because I asked really awkward questions people say I'm a bit challenging but she loved the fact I asked questions and I probably asked some questions in her information day because it was just humoring me but she said I stood out in the crowd and and from that I'm forever grateful Judy over at Camden Islington and Miss O'Neill they wrote my references for my first job and for me that was a big step for a therapist and a surgeon they only knew me as a patient service user to write a reference for me was just like wow I hadn't worked for five and a half years and UCLH took me on as a patient director you know, I was a patient director and again big shouts out to Natasha Curran and Lisa Anton who's my mentor and put up with me when I was like up and down like a yo-yo who interviewed me and got me onto that role so I think there are people that you can see who have helped along the way and there's people that I'm still in touch with and it's amazing I, I think to myself sometimes I think how am I here what am I doing my mum thinks it's hilarious still can't work out what the hell I do but yeah they're just like where are you talking you're talking in Brazil to who so she just thinks it's really funny but she's always said that there's one thing she never worries about is that I'll always find a way yeah I had a friend once who said to me they used to call me Chris and it's like oh you know where there's a will, there's a way. And where there's a way, there's Chris. So it's very much true that I'm always looking for opportunities. It's probably because actually my head's 100 miles per hour. So I'm always multitasking in my own kind of way. But when you land in a place where that energy and that kind of fun side isn't dampened, then you can just like blossom and just really have fun. I've never been in a job really where actually I've enjoyed it so much and it's because I'm really fortunate I know I'm really fortunate that I'm given a lot of freedom to go with the energy and I think that helps because it meant I found other people and we've just keep on growing and it's a bit like a it's a movement isn't it so that comes back to the networks doesn't it absolutely the fantastic networks you're building particularly with I suppose this is what I see the lived experience partners and what an incredible group of people you're pulling together there got to remind you I keep telling you this it's what we're doing yeah yeah <laughs> people bring people in and it's, it's us and it's not just about me and I'm really particular about that because I think having been in a role like a patient director where I found it quite isolating and quite lonely that I promised myself that I wouldn't go on this journey alone so I used to have a really bad joke in the beginning I want to tell you it so I'd say I don't worry <laughs> beware listeners <laughs> no no something like that <laughs> so you know when you climb the ladder you know you take people with you and then I used to say yeah because if you fall off the ladder it's a softer landing <laughs> so uh, but you can't say that Christina but like, well, I've said it now you know so it's out there but the reality is um, I have amazing people that have been on this journey with me for three years people that I would love to see working right beside me one day very much on the wage in a team that would be amazing I live in hope one day. So it's always about dreaming big and things can happen. And every time I think, is that really possible? Then something else amazing happens. So I can't believe they haven't kicked me out yet. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I sit on a fence and there's no doubt about it. it it's, it's a very unusual role <laughs> because I am given a lot of freedom. Well, I'm really glad that you do dream big, Christina, and long may it continue. I guess the way I see it, what you do and the good humour that you bring to it all is pulling people together rather than apart. It's moving things forward. Otherwise, I don't know, it would just be lip service and people can see straight through that. I'm glad you feel appreciated and I guess it's central to this conversation, isn't it, that when people feel appreciated and supported, they do a better job. But the last couple of years have just been so difficult for everyone. It's been an amazingly sad, amazingly uh, fast couple of years. Like, where have the last two years been? Because actually, our whole lives have changed, haven't they? So, but would I have met so many people? I doubt it in that short time. Yeah, it's been extraordinary for that. You know, when I was having really a lot of panic attacks and I couldn't even make it to an appointment, it wasn't so much just because I was on crutches. It would be because I'd get to the front door and I'd just have a panic attack and I couldn't leave. You couldn't call up and just say, look, I'm having a panic attack. Can you please change my appointment? It'd be like DNA didn't did not arrive. And because you've been in too much of a state to actually ring through. And and I just think to myself, there was people that are housebound or whichever word we want to use today. I was housebound for a lot of it. When you know, my anxiety kept me indoors, 
And so for me, any time I felt vulnerable triggered lots of things in my life. So I just think to myself, actually, we've been able to connect with people that aren't going out much. Those people that are shielded groups. And for me, you know, lots of people talked about working from home. And I'm like, I wanted to work from home. And people wouldn't believe that you're working from home. You know, I worked in IT years ago, like I mentioned. And we were doing remote working years ago, absolute years ago. And then it just seems that what's amazing is how much things have caught up. The society's accepted people working from home. But I find it still really sad. I find it sad that it's taken a pandemic for people to realise there is a whole workforce of people with disabilities who could work from home. Uh, you know, there's a whole group of people with additional support, reasonable adjustments, can give a really, really good impact on any work. And I think it's opened up opportunities, but I still find it a little bit sad. It's taken a pandemic for people to realise. Yeah. And trusting people to work at home. And I think that comes back to one of the themes that's coming through on the podcast is around trust and what you assume. And this takes me back to my background in local government, in social care and like the roots of whose shoes really in terms of personalisation and personal budgets. But could you trust people with this money? Could you trust them to actually make good decisions about how that money would help them rather than we, the managers, who know what people need? And you know, it's that whole tension and trust and Rachel saying that she had to have a scan to actually be believed that she hadn't got a bladder. It had been removed. Yeah, I know. Uh, you not believe somebody with something like that. And I think it's, I think it's actually quite cruel to put somebody through a scan unnecessarily so I met Rachel when I presented at expo with Carol Munt got got to have a shout out for Carol here we have we have she's the original pirate but Carol spotted me she spotted me speaking at something and I'll be honest with you I blame Carol blame Carol for everything it's all her fault I'm here but you know (laughs) know, what's really funny is our birthdays one day apart so it's really quite amusing so I'm like oh I'm like mini Carol (laughs) so yeah it's really funny but (laughs) I have a lot of respect I have a lot of respect for the people that came before me without a doubt there are people that you know haven't always seen eye to eye with don't necessarily agree with everything that's said inevitably but I have utmost respect for the people that came before me and had to scream and shout you know when I came along I think I said in my interview as a patient director I'm ready to sit down and talk but I absolutely respect all the people before me and you know I will give out a shout out to Alison Cameron without a doubt because it's how I spotted you Jill because I saw your interaction with her on Twitter and I thought who's this lady now who's this who's shoes and I think that's what um when some people had forgotten how to be kind, you were always really kind. And that's what I spotted. I don't think I've ever told you that before. And I spotted that in you and I thought, hmm, there's something here. You know, what, what, what is it? And so for me, you know, we're not always 100%. I'm not always 100%. You, you, you see the fun side of me. You see the side where I'm not in tears. But I've done so much crying in my life. I think that I'm still laughing every day that I'm able to be at work, that I'm having fun with it and that... Nobody stopped my, uh, and I will say crazy ideas because this Lemonade Radio I, is definitely, uh, you know, my wife, bless her, she's just like, do whatever you need to do. She's just like, <laughs> it's a hobby for me. We're doing it all ourselves. We're not trying to raise any funds. It's just about connecting people and trying to do it on a budget and proving that it can be done on a budget. So, yeah, so Lemonade Radio, which it was all about when the world gives you lemons, we'll give you lemonade radio. And without a doubt, it's so going to be so cheesy, I'm sure. Now, why didn't anybody else tell me about it? Apparently, there's this new thing called lemonade radio. You should know about it. Check it out. www.lemonade.radio Because you love lemons too. And I was like, oh, wow, look, it's all about lemons. Yeah, we do do lemons too. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I think it's those connections and it's those, like, you know, things that you can giggle about that just makes each day a little bit easier. And the connections, I mean, I think there's a whole thing there around the the other half, the long suffering, (laughs) the Mr. Who shoes, the people that are so important in terms of supporting us with these wacky and, you know, time consuming take over your lives. Like when I told him I was starting a podcast series. I think he thought it might take quite a bit of my time and it has done, but you know, he's, he's special. He's supported me with it and not to go on without mentioning Ali and 
sometimes you know the stories that sit behind things and some of it quite you you couldn't plan it so the scottish yeah. connection that alice and cameron have with my mum and tweeting as Jill's mum, and sometimes they'd actually have a chat together. And my mum suddenly became this Scottish person with a proper Scottish accent. And she wasn't putting it on, I promise you, she wasn't putting it on. Her parents were Scottish. She'd grown up with a completely Scottish accent, went to school, <laughs> and they laughed at her. So she turned it off. And that was the only accent I'd known. But then suddenly she became comparing we timorous cowering beasties or whatever it was with Alison. So some of these Twitter relationships, the connections, they're very special in all sorts of hidden ways as well as the things that people actually see. But the timeliness, I think, you know, you were talking about your role now, lived experience ambassador and the people who've gone before you. I think like the work that I do, you know, personal budgets and so on, change takes time and there are people who've gone before you and sometimes there's a timeliness in terms of when you come along and perhaps like the next generation almost, but everybody has contributed and done their bit enormously. Absolutely. And for me, it's exhausting. Come on, need more people to take over because I'm tired after just two years for like being full throttle. But, you know, w without a doubt. And I remember, I remember contacting Alison, never spoken to her before. And actually, we didn't actually speak for another two years, probably. But I messaged her and said, I found one of her videos really inspirational because she talks about being homeless. And I hadn't really talked about being homeless and that how I had no choice but to go back into domestic violence or live in my car. And so it was it was them kind of connections that you just think, oh, and you do look back at your life and you do think, you know, I'm 45. I'm not ashamed to say it, but. I act like I'm much younger because I love it. Why not? You know, it's like, you know, why do you have to behave like you're at the end? It's just, um, for me, each day that I have still here, I'm very grateful for. I, you know, I've had a rough time. 20 something years ago, I might have not have been here. So for me, it's, it's hard to talk about some of the things. I won't go into it too much. But, you know, there are times where I felt like I had no one even though I was surrounded by lots of people. I talked about it when I was on the radio last year about you can feel so lonely even when you're in a room full of people or even in a house full of people. And that's how I felt. That's why immediately I kind of tried to get some help and hadn't felt suicidal in so many years. And I had, and, you know, and I did in, you know, in, in lockdown one and it was quite a shock to me, I think. And part of my recovery is to talk about it. So is you know, a bit of a trigger for some people but the reality is it helps me and it helps me get by each day and, and <laughs> if I kept everything I talk so much can you imagine if I kept it all in my head and I didn't have it uh, an outlet no, I would definitely be quite unwell I reckon so for me the more I get out easier it is on me and the better I sleep and that comes back to the radio without a doubt I had no idea that playing on the radio and having fun was going to make me able to sleep better you know lockdown one I was sleeping one hour if I was lucky at night because I just couldn't sleep it was it was awful so for me I started playing I was like wow I can sleep people are like, how can you do this after work I was like oh I don't care if I still get four hours sleep this is fantastic so it's finding those things that help you and people have hobbies etc or what can I do when I'm at home? Because I don't want to get out there. You know, I'm still in the high risk group and I don't want to be out uh, unless I need to, apart from going to watch Arsenal, I have to tell you that. So that's the only time. And even that is very strategic, how I go in, how I leave without passing many people. So I think, <laughs> you know, what I'd love to see is many more people being able to talk about their experiences and, and connecting with each other and not having that fear of speaking to each other and just learning a little bit more about each other as well. I think you're bringing something that's just so real and the more people who do speak out or just chat really about their experiences rather than necessarily a big deal presentation or something very formal, I think those are the things that kind of encourage others to... I think we find this at our workshops that you get people wondering how it's going to be and then somebody lets down their guard a bit and says what, yeah. what happened to them and then somebody else and you can see the other people around the table they're just strangers often who've just met each other but immediately there's a bond there people are prepared to share more and to realize that we're all kind of human together and that we can find a solution yeah. together rather than a big thing I think we've explored a lot with whose shoes is the us and them and the us and them can be the team next door or it can be the early work I did around 
care homes in particular, you know, like the care staff and the catering staff. And it doesn't make one lot the bad guys. But if you're doing personalised care, what does that actually mean? Does it mean in terms of regular meal times, actually being able to order the food in to know what people want and to give them choice? But perhaps you've got a farmer who's used to getting up at five in the morning. Perhaps you've got a woman with dementia or, or a man with dementia who wants to wander into the kitchen and peel the carrots or whatever health and safety that's really where who shoes was born you know taking real examples and thinking we all want this in that case home you know people's home to be the best it can be but what's the reality in terms of living there working there or being a family member but don't you think Jill that they are like buzzwords though aren't they because shared decision making I'll be honest with you from very early on in my kind of long journey of my ankle, I've had three operations. It was always shared decision making about alternative type treatments. I was a bit of a guinea pig and uh, yeah, I'm very well known in some places because I screamed that clinic down, but let's try it. It might work, you know, that I had some quite radical interventions that kept me walking, thankfully. But for me, I look back and I just think I had shared decision making. I was having those conversations because they weren't leaving that room until I got what I wanted to know. But I know that not everyone could do that. My mum would go in and just be like, okay, thank you, doctor. And that'd be it. And it was like, whatever the doctor said, what went, you know? So for me, having somebody say to me, oh, have you worked out which ankle replacement you want? And I'd be like, blah, 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 my statistics. And he'd be like, no, you're too mobile. You'll wear it out in a year. And I'm like, oh, so yeah. But I learned things like I can't, if I fuse my ankle, I will never be able to have a replacement. Whereas if I wait for technology, potentially I could have a replacement. And then if it fails, I still have the option for a fusion. So it's those kind of things, those nuggets of information I would never have got had I not had those conversations with very open-minded surgeons who just, one, you know, knew I wasn't going to leave until they kind of answered some questions, but actually took the time to explain things to me. Because I was like, just give me a new ankle. Everybody has new hip knees and hips, you know. Why can't I have a new ankle? And it was just like, no, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, if there's anybody out there who ever wants to give me a tailor's um, made, like, 3D printed titanium one, I'm willing to be a guinea pig. <laughs> I always say it. I found somebody, I think it was somebody in India was having one done. And then somebody in, in America contacted me and was having one done. And I was like, I can only dream. But even so, you know, it was an unusual break from having that broken ankle to not walking for that many months to then the impact on medication on me and opioid medication as well and coming off those. And I just think to myself, if I look back at my journey and if I'd known what I knew now, I potentially wouldn't have gastritis. I potentially, the, the anemia that I've got, they're all, some of them are like, you know, related to the medication over the years. But if I hadn't taken those medications, would I still be up and about as much as I am? So it's looking at what works for you. And I think for me, it's always been that trying to find that combination of what helps me in my health and just being able to put my hands up and say, you know what, today's a bad day. I've got arthritis. When it's cold, it is not great, you know. And so the reality is having that openness where I'm really fortunate in my role, you know. I talk about my physical health and my, and my mental health, which means it comes as no surprise to anyone. And like you mentioned, onions, because there is multiple layers. There really are. So sometimes I even go, oh, yeah, I forgot that happened to me. But I, I think... What's important is how you connect with people and, you know, the real fuel, the real fuel behind why I'm here and doing what I do is without a doubt my best friend, Diane. And, you know, I'm probably saving this to the end because it might make me cry and I don't do crying um, quite publicly. But the reality is Diane was my best friend for years. We met, we worked, uh, worked at Mark Spencer's Marble Arch, actually. That's where we met. I was 16, very fresh face. She was older. And I have no idea whatever drew us together because we were chalk and cheese. We were without a doubt chalk and cheese. But she helped me from when I went to study abroad on Erasmus. She was a person that passed me an envelope and said, look, I'll help you out. And I just feel like those things, those people that give you that step up, that reaching hand, take it and just see where it goes. So for me, it is about giving back in whichever way I can and and yeah, I try and keep true. And sometimes none of us are perfect, are we? So, you know, don't annoy me because then you'll definitely know I have not got a poker face whatsoever. So, so far, I've been really fortunate that if it gets to those situations, I've got other people that bail me out. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you won't believe what's going through in my mind now. I guess when we do Who's Shoes workshops and people do their pledges, 
And I've got this thing now that I pretty much guarantee, certainly in my own mind, that I can add some value by linking them to somebody who's already doing it or somebody, you know, within our enormous community and on Twitter and so on. You know, it's lonely trying to make positive change on your own and it's fun when you link with others and it's even more fun when you make proper friends and magic mates and so on. But as you were talking just then, I'm thinking... Oh, my goodness, wouldn't an amazing, just extraordinary outcome of a podcast with Christina be find someone who can make you a 3D printed ankle? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if I'm probably chicken out of the yacht, but I'd be like, I was only kidding, only kidding, don't listen to me. But, um, but, you know, you know, just aside from all the jokes and stuff, you know, I've got a lot of love for a lot of people. and, And me too, I have. You know, and I think... I try and stay away from the negative because it's actually quite draining. It doesn't do me personally any good. Um, and so I try and try, you know, and you get drawn into it. They, they, you know, I call them energy vampires, you know, they try and... Well, I call them hoovers. <laughs> do you? So the uh, hoovers, yeah, energy vampires with a teeth heading for me. So eat a bit of garlic and carry on moving on because actually I don't, I've been through too much to get sucked into all of that. I think I'm in a good place right now. I'm really fortunate that, Kate's by my side and <laughs> you know we bicker like any other relationship but 15 years down the road she hasn't walked away yet so it's great it's not easy being me I'm not gonna lie if you think it's exhausting listening to me <laughs> it's definitely exhausting being me trust me so I think at times when people say to me oh you need to take a break they don't realize how much all of this is part of my recovery and part of my keeping well so it isn't just about fear of missing out but actually I love it. And so for me, I'm going where the energy is. And I always keep my heart, Diane, my best friend, Diane Osborne. And the fact I have responsibility, you know, I inherited two, two well, they're young men now. They were 21, Tyrell and Kyle. I love them very much. And they are my boys now. So you know, the fact that they're, you know, high functioning autistic, I'm so proud that they went to university. One of them came out first, the other one, two, one, the year after their mum died. 10 years she was ill with kidney failure and dialysis and a failed transplant and she always held her head up high and kept you know saying keep on going was always so proud of me so for me that's what's deep down what's really deep down is not only giving back to a service that really helped my mum when I was born you know I was born with a dent in my head she said to me oh I thought you were gonna be stupid I was like no mum you can't say things like that and I was like maybe I'm a bit like different though and she's just like "Mm." (laughs) you know that's the translation so I won't tell you what she actually said in Portuguese but um I was born with a dent in my head I've got birthmark down my face because I was hanging out of cancer for nine months you know if I can hang out of cancer for nine months in the womb then you know I can face anything I reckon so that's my philosophy on life now and seeing my best friend fight to get to the point where the boys were 21 10 years you know you've got you've got to have fire in your belly to keep on going and when you can't you know you've just got to heal and keep on going after yeah this is just resonating so much with me I'm my own cancer experience the different attitude to life that I've had since then in terms of I think I was almost a bit of a life's too short for all the the rubbish kind of person but now I really am and again, in terms of like going with the flow I and mean, with like developing whose shoes, I just want to connect with the people who want genuinely to make things happen. I steer away from meetings. I steer away from staff. I find ways of doing things that involve minimal staff and hopefully, because part of it, I think it's more rewarding. It's more interesting for me. And people like me were giving quite a few shout outs along the way. I don't know if you follow on Twitter, Sam Majumda. He's a fantastic ear, nose and throat surgeon up in Scotland. And he's been, we call ourselves like mutual mentors. Oh, great. So I helped him originally with Get Going with social media and so on. But Sam's got such an incredible philosophy of life. And like Jill, just go with the flow and just building on that in a more gentle way. A lovely, gentle guy who what matters to you in terms of what matters to his patients way before that was a you know hashtag just like (laughs) how he is so okay so I've dipped into um quite randomly I think the other night at midnight I saw Christina (laughs) jumping up and down and asking if we wanted to tune into Lemonade Radio and Mr Who Shoes was sitting there Colin and I think you put Stairway to Heaven on for him (laughs) 
<laughs> which he very much appreciated. So tell yep. us a bit more. I yep, think you know, it's time did. to kind of tell us about Lemonade Radio and what's happening today, 6th of February. So I'm not going to go into too much about the past, but if you look at hashtag Lady L. XA, which is, stands for Lived Experience Ambassador, you'll you'll get a bit of the history. But I wanted to wait respectfully for a year to actually try and launch something myself. I also needed the funds to do it. So for me, prior to working for the NHS, I'd just gone bankrupt. So I'd been bankrupt. So for me, I didn't even know if I could start a company, to be honest. So just decided to let's see what we can do and see where licensing, etc. And it's just it won't be a 24-hour station because I still got a job, right? So I haven't convinced Kate to give up her art to uh, to like play all day. But the reality is it's just a way of connecting. So, you know, when I was on the radio before, we did a lot of talking, just connecting people and co-producing playlists and things like that. And it just became a bit of a game, really. Like, you know, somebody plays, you want this song for this person, a shout out, and then they would send me it and I'd be like the go-between and they go, oh, this is what they're saying. And, and I just think it was just, it broke it up a little bit. It broke up what was, was a very serious situation. And then what I realised, was just a bit of fun. And, you know, I'm not great at the whole technical bit. I'm still learning. But f- from that, what we realised was the people that got in touch with me over the last year. When are you coming back on? And actually, not just about the energy. And I can get, I get more silly, especially if you give me a glass of wine on the radio. But I get more silly. But the reality is, there's no agenda. It isn't about... You know, I just want to connect with people and I'm really honest about it. My agenda is quite openly out there. It helps my sleep. You know, it helps me and my PTSD. It just puts my head somewhere else so that I'm not overthinking things. And I just love when it comes to some songs, I, it takes me back and I'm like, wow, I forgot about this song. And I'm like, why do I even know this song? You know, my parents are Portuguese. Like, did they really listen to this stuff? I don't think so. So why do I know the words? So yeah, it's really quite funny. And, and it gives me a chance also to go back to my roots a bit because, you know, I'm very proud of being Madeiran, Madeiran, as we say. We are a Portuguese island, but the reality is we're very different to mainland Portugal. And so you know, if you don't know where Madeira is, it is where Ronaldo the footballer is from. And we're just off Northwest Africa, off the Moroccan coast above the Canaries, basically. And so it is a, a little island that it was one of the poorest, poorest places in Portugal, one of its poorest states. And so now it isn't, thankfully. When my dad left there, he left my mum, my sister was one month old, and he left to come to Jersey um, in 1970. And, you know, they did 30 years here. And we said, you know, set up and go home, you know, like, and it was like, well, what's home? I'll make something, I'll do something, you know, and that's what they did. And they've just celebrated 20 years. My dad told me when I was there a few weeks ago that actually he thought he only had five to ten years, you know, left in him because of his health. And he went out there and, you know, 20 years later, I'm really quite fortunate that they're still here. So for me, they've always taught us to work hard and if something's not working, just change it and do what you need to do to kind of survive. Because we come into this world alone, we leave this world alone. So I think it's really important to do what you can to help others while you're here. Christina, that was amazing. So if I want to plan my day to day, then what do I need to do? When do I need to be around? Is anything exciting happening? Well, absolutely. So today is my mum's birthday. Uh, Happy birthday, mum. So basically, today at five o'clock, I'll be um, launching Lemonade dot radio so it's www.lemonade dot radio when you go on just press listen and you should be able to find it and if you look on twitter you'll be able to find all just follow the lemons if it's not through who shoes just follow the lemons you're bound to find some tweets but yeah lemonade radio uk you'll find me on there and if there's any special requests then please do let me know just send me a, a direct message and please yeah follow along and let's see where we can go with this it's it's just a bit of fun and I just want people to reconnect and just you know remember some good times so you know there'll be some funny shows I'm planning the sweet and sour hour which will be um either like songs that somebody that you're sweet on or for your ex that you're sour on so yeah I told you it's going to be yeah cheesy squeezy for sure but um <laughs> yeah and there's a few other ideas you know lived experienced ladies will still be working on that but um yeah watch this space I won't say more yet enormous good luck with it all Christina you know I'm not particularly into statistics but I hope you get lots of listeners and I know you've already got one very special statistics which is number of listeners bouncing on a waterbed one at... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that was so random, wasn't it? I was just like, I didn't even know she had a water bed. I won't name her, but I was like, really? I was like, wow. So thank you for talking to me today, Christina. It's been amazing and wishing you every success with Lemonade Radio. Oh, thank you so much for having me and like really thank you for everything you're doing to make sure co-production is still in everybody's lips. It's great working with you. Thank you. Hey, what's that? Lemonade? On the radio? Ooh. www.lemonade.radio I hope you have enjoyed this episode. If so... Please subscribe now to hear more of these fascinating conversations on your favourite podcast platform and please leave a review. I tweet as Who's Shoes. Thank you for being on this journey with me and let's hope that together we can make a difference. <laughs>